Good morning. Maybe we'll do this like we do with the kids. If you can hear my voice, say, shh. <laughs> oh, those tricks from kids' ministry never grow old. I got my eyes on you guys up here, okay? Just so you know. Before you start, I'm going to make an announcement. By all means. Would you like my mic? Since I'm the pastor, I can do that, right? You're one of the pastors, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, very good. I love that. And just so you guys know, we, we did not coordinate. On purpose. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we're, we're continuing on in our study on biblical theology. Oh, thanks. You can stay close. Um, we're, and, and I just, I want to uh, kind of give a, give out a book if someone would be interested, and you don't have to take it right now, or you might want to think about it. This is um, the whole story of the Bible in 16 verses by Chris Bruno. He's actually one of our missionaries, you know, to the you know, he's suffering on the island of Hawaii, um, and, and yet he's written several books. I mentioned it, and this is a really helpful, small, 130-page book on the whole story of the Bible in 16 verses. <clears throat> Someone want this? Read it. Um, Herm, you're going to read it? You'll read it this week. Okay. Uh, I might have another copy for you, Lorianne. I think I do. So, here you go. Okay. You can't sell it. Here you go. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that announcement. I love that our church gives away so many good books. So this week we're going to be diving into class number two as we go through biblical theology throughout the rest of the year. And then as we start this week, I'm going to read an excerpt from a gospel that almost killed me. Now, of course, you can't read my notes here, but it's a gospel that almost killed me. I'm in a bathtub. I can't get up. I feel like I'm about to die. Mercury poisoning. The water in the tub has grown cold. I'm floating in and out of consciousness. Whenever I can concentrate, I begin to pray. Jesus, please. Save me. Please heal me. I repent. I put my whole heart into prayer right now and I, I cast out any doubt or fear. I know you can heal me. Please heal me. My mom's keys are rattling on the doorknob now. I hear the door thud shut in the distance. I hear her purse sliding across the counter and her keys leaning next to it. I barely recognize her figure as she tries with all her wiry might to pull me out of the tub. I spend the next two days in the hospital. My mom wants to know why I didn't let her know, why I didn't want to go to the hospital, why I didn't do something. Mom, Jesus is my doctor. I'm blessed and I know that he would have healed me. This is me trying to live out what I think is true Christianity. You see, I had gotten saved just two months prior, and I'm fresh out of jail, and I'm walking around the projects where I used to stomp like a tiny teenage giant. I've got a bare back, a few tattoos, and a Bible in my hand, and I'm praying for just the right opportunity so I can share the Christ with someone. I meet a man named Roger who invites me into his home. He buys me lunch, and we spend all day talking about the Bible. This guy knows more scripture than me. I've never heard anyone spout off so many scriptures in such rapid-fire succession. This guy is legit, I mutter under my breath. And over the course of the next six months, this man indoctrinates me with the prosperity gospel. Just a few months earlier, I'd never even opened a Bible. I had no idea that I was being given arsenic in my Kool-Aid. I take it all in. I believe it all. Hook, line, and sinker. I know it's true. It has to be. It's right here in the scripture. Look! Look! She touched the hem of his garment and he was healed. Look! Jesus couldn't heal them because they didn't have enough faith. Look! All throughout the Old Testament there are curses for sins and blessings for righteousness, prosperity for good, and pain for bad. It's so plain. It's so obvious. 
but stuff isn't making sense. I'm still without a job. I can't pay my rent. My mom isn't getting saved, and I keep getting cold sores. None of these things should be happening. There must be some sin hidden somewhere in my heart, something I haven't repented of. Now I've got the flu and I don't have any money to buy groceries. I just need to claim it. I just, I just need to rebuke Satan and his lies and believe that what I have proclaimed in the name of Jesus will surely come to pass. Maybe I'm not tithing enough. Time to double up. I know God will pay me back 100-fold, maybe even more. I just need to sow in faith. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the introduction to a Nine Marks article entitled, A Gospel That, Only, that Almost Killed Me. And again, you have to pick up on the quotes here, the scary quotes. That is not the gospel. Now, the hard part about all of us for us to hear this is to know that we probably know someone who has those sort of thoughts. They believe that if they just name it and claim it, if they just pray enough, if they just had enough faith, then God would give them what they asked for. And, and what's maybe to an nth degree more hurtful than that is that they can prove to you why they believe that way. And they're going to bring up the same Bible app you do on your phone. It's going to be the same translation of the Bible you read at home with your family. So what's the difference between the way they believe and the way you believe? Well, Paul would tell us that we need to rightly divide the word. We need to rightly handle the word. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. You see, this young man who was discipled by his friend Roger, well, that Roger fellow really didn't know his Bible rightly. And so he led Sean astray by teaching him the Bible. That's a scary thought, isn't it? That you, with pure motives, good intentions, can teach someone other the Bible and do more damage than good almost killing someone else because you've taught them something that is not found in Scripture. I mean, sure, you, you made it appear as if it was there, but it really wasn't. Last week, Pastor Daniel talked to us about biblical theology, and he gave us a really good definition. He said, biblical theology is the discipline of learning how to read the Bible as one story by one divine author that centers on the person and work of Christ so that every part of Scripture is understood in relation to Christ. It's a way to read the Bible. And I was really excited when Pastor Mike told me the teens would be in here because then I could use more Marvel references. You guys and you gals, think about leading up into Endgame. 21 movies over a decade plus. And you don't understand one movie out of the context of the whole one unified cinematic universe. You can't just pick and choose what you want and make it say something that's not there. There is one unified story. Just like with the Bible, we have 66 books, Old and New Testaments, many, many human authors, but ultimately only one spiritual, divine author, all telling the same thing, that Jesus is God and that he is the way, the way to heaven. So when we think about biblical theology, you could also say that it's a hermeneutic. That's a big seminary word that really just means it's a way to read your Bible and understand what it's saying. And so if last week we understood what biblical theology is, today we're going to answer the question, why biblical theology? And the short answer is, is that biblical theology guards and guides churches. Biblical theology guards and guides churches. So let's talk about some of these. I've got a pop quiz for you. I'm going to read some verses, and I'd like some of you to raise your hand and volunteer and speak up nice and loudly and tell me how someone might understand or interpret these verses wrongly. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 5. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. How might someone interpret those verses incorrectly? Jay.
Good. He, he said, yeah, he, what well, he was saying, if you couldn't hear in the back or on the live stream, um, if you obey God, you will have lots of kids and a lot of provisions, a lot of wealth, your career and things like that will flourish. Denise, did you have your hand up as well? Yeah, if you obey, you have lots of money. Here's another one. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. How might someone interpret that wrongly? Jim. Yeah. The more you give, the more you'll receive. If you want to become wealthy, give more. It says right here that the generous person will prosper. That's a way to understand this verse wrongly. And prosperity churches, prosperity gospel preachers use verses like these to say that you should give generously to the teacher, to the institution. If you give to me so that I can buy a nicer car or a bigger house or a really expensive pair of sneakers... And that's, that's not a joke. There are Instagram and social media accounts out there, preacher sneakers. That's, you can do a search, you'll figure out the right word for it. But people who claim to be men of God wearing three and four digit sneakers. And I get sometimes, you know, if you've got a large foot, shoes aren't cheap. They are going to top over 100. But we're talking like six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollar a pair of sneakers. And they have several stacks. And that's what they say, though, that if you're obedient, you will be blessed. Your crops will grow, your cows will give milk, your children will prosper, your marriage will thrive. All right, here's some more for us. 1 Chronicles 4.10. Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. How might someone interpret that wrongly? Tess. Love that answer. The idea that as soon as he prayed, boom, everything just, all of the pain disappeared. Everything was, was perfect again. Now, I'll give us two more uh, in succession. Matthew 18, 19, and then Matthew 21, 22. Here's Jesus talking. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. How might someone interpret this wrongly? Yeah, genie in the bottle. You got this uh, this big vending machine in the sky sort of deal. You just press the right button and you get what you want. And if we take it one step further and, and instead of saying it, ask and you shall receive sort of deal if you have faith, let's say it negatively. You don't have because you don't have faith. All of these verses are favorites of prosperity preachers and they lead to that name it and claim it philosophy which you mentioned, genie in a bottle, vending machine in the sky. Uh, some of you might remember 1 Chronicles 4.10 was the basis of Bruce Wilkinson's book published in 2000 called uh, The Prayer of Jabez, which sold 9 million copies. 9 million copies. And if we're being honest with us, if we're being honest with each other and ourselves, if I asked you to raise your hand, to acknowledge or admit or confess that you've ever done something like this. God, I I know you are powerful, Jesus. I I know you hold the keys to the kingdom. Lord, you have all of the power in the universe. I know that you can get me into General Motors. I know you can help me get this job. God, I, I, I totally and fully believe, I repent, I empty myself of all of my human desires, Lord, but I need an education. God, I know that you can get me into U of M. I know you can. And so I claim this victory in your name. Lord God, I, you, you know my life and you know my heart, Lord, and I am not perfect, but God, you, you are perfect and you are holy and you have all of the power and right now my friend is sick. 
And so, Lord, I, I've heard and I've read how you've raised those from the dead and you've healed the, the lame and you've given the blind their sight back. Lord, I know that you can heal my friend. So, Lord, I, I claim this victory in your name. Or maybe you don't say that last part. Maybe you're not to that point where you say, I claim this victory in your name, but you still say, Lord, I know you can do it, and so I'm going to thank you for it now. We probably have a room full of people with their hands up because we've all been in a moment of desperation where it was just too good to be true. We see something in Scripture, and without investigating it to make sure we're properly understanding it, we're just taking it and running with it. So we have to ask ourselves, what are these verses actually about? What does the Bible actually say in context? <clears throat> but before we dive into that, here's one more for us. Colossians 1.15, talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. How might someone misinterpret that? Go ahead and just shout it out if you got an answer. Yeah, right, and, and if you're just looking on the surface, that's almost kind of what it says. He is the firstborn of all creation. It looks like that's what it means. And your friendly neighborhood Jehovah's Witnesses are going to tell you that same thing. They're going to let you know that Jesus is not God and that he did not exist in eternity past. Instead, he was created, and they're going to show you right here in your Bible, your translation of the Bible, Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. And we've had other different sects try to twist the scripture. We had theological liberalism about 100 years ago recast the narrative about social gospel, economic injustice, and political conscience, and all of these other things. And, but oh, we could also talk about Roman Catholicism. So we, we dive into the Old Testament, and we see how... Uh, the man of God is not referred to as a pastor or an elder necessarily. What are they called? What's the man of God called in the Old Testament? The one who represented the people. Lord. Priest. Yes, they're called priests. And so in Roman Catholicism, even today, the person who would be up here would likely be called a priest. Now, now why is that? Is it because in the Old Testament... Only the priest could go in and offer the sacrifice. They were the only ones that could offer up Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist. Is that because in the Lord's Supper they believe that the bread and the wine actually turn into the real physical body and blood of Christ? And so they would have to be called priest in order to be qualified? But the problem here isn't really just with a couple of verses. It's really about understanding verses in context throughout the Bible as a whole. And so if we think about biblical theology, about a way of reading the Bible and understanding it, we realize that so many areas where we have false teaching, whether it be Roman Catholicism, Jehovah's Witness, or prosperity gospel preachers, has to do with an imbalance or uh, an issue of continuity or discontinuity is what my notes say. But really it's the idea of are they bringing in too much of the Old Testament into the New? Are they bringing too much of the New Testament and putting it back in the Old? Or are they thinking about eternity future and trying to bring it into the now? And I know that that can be really confusing, which is why we're going to take it step by step. In history, you've probably heard about the Anabaptists. This was the group of people who thought that they could bring heaven to earth by actually being perfect, that they would be perfected saints. And if you've lived more than a day, you probably realize how foolish that seems. We don't actually think we can be perfect, do we? We don't, but some people actually did, and, and some of them probably still do. The point is, we have imbalanced and false gospels, which are taught in imbalanced and false churches, and it's dangerous. And we ask ourselves, how do I avoid making sure I'm not imbalanced and false? How do I make sure that this church is not imbalanced and false? How do I make sure that we get the truth right? And, and in our lesson today, we're going to we're gonna really tackle how not to proof text. Proof texting is dangerous. And really what that is, is it's when you take a verse or a passage of Scripture out of its context 
out of its original meaning, out of its original purpose, and you use it improperly. It's kind of like taking something and then really twisting it so that it can be what you want it to be. It wasn't just a little piece of paper. It's an origami swan. Don't laugh. That was my first try. But that's really what it is. It's proof texting. They're grabbing something that they like out of context. Some of you have heard me say, there's a shirt out there. I really need to get it. It says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Oh, I love that shirt. Those people, yes, sir. Right now, well, <laughs> let's, let's give this as a great opportunity for the class while I think on that one a moment. Can anyone here think of an example of proof texting? Where maybe someone is, Dan. Yeah, that's a great example. Instead of finding a passage and unpacking what's there, you're just hopping around on all these topical ideas to try to get a point across. Now, what about people who believe that you need to do good works to go to heaven? They're going to go and probably find some verses in James, aren't they? Completely ignoring what Paul says. They're going to be people who... How controversial do you want me to get, Pastor? Because I, I will just throw it out there. You're going to talk to some people who believe that Jesus died for absolutely everyone because there are many verses that have the word all in it in our English translations. And out of context, if you're just reading that one verse, those two verses, these six verses, and it says Jesus died for all. And you're go, you're, that's what you're going to walk away with. But what is the all referring to? Is it absolutely everyone, which means we believe every person ever born is going to get saved? Or do we mean, bingo, all that the Father would give to him, being the elect? But back to the lesson at hand. Proof texting is dangerous. And, and we've all done it. We've all spent some time looking for a verse to try to prove a point or as a launching point into something else. And the stories that some of these movements, whether it be Jehovah's Witnesses or Roman Catholicism or the, gospel, uh, the prosperity gospel teachers, what's, what's really hard for us to think about is that what they're saying isn't necessarily all wrong. And isn't that how Satan works with half-truths? Or with a big lie that does have a kernel of truth? Especially if I see those words in the Bible like our illustration from the beginning, the guy who wrote the book, everything he was taught was shown to him directly from the Bible. So in each case, we have bad or imbalanced biblical theologies that proclaim bad or imbalanced gospels, and they produce bad or imbalanced churches. So real quick, let's think about Deuteronomy 28. If you faithfully obey, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. How are we supposed to read that? We read it knowing that it was a promise given explicitly to the people of Israel, not to us. Yes, God was establishing an unbreakable link between righteousness and blessing. You must be righteous to be blessed. But at this point of redemptive history, God was teaching the people about their inability to be righteous in their own strength. If you keep reading the rest of that book, you're going to find out that God tells Israel, you can't be good enough. I'm actually going to have to give you my righteousness for you to be blessed. So that's certainly not something you might want to claim. Well, I just have to be righteous enough, and God will give me what I want. Well, keep reading. God says you can't. God says you cannot be. Or what about Jesus' promises in Matthew about asking for anything in his name? Or especially if we ask in faith, then he'll answer us. Well, if you go back to Matthew 18 and you keep reading in context, you're going to see it's about who speaks for Jesus. That's the gathered church. Just like the people of Israel once spoke for God, 
So what's more is that Jesus is really diving in here, and he's tackling the heart of the issue. It's not necessarily the faith you possess as you pray. It's about your object of faith. Is Jesus the one in whom you place your faith? Is that what you're clinging to? And then we tackle the idea of Jesus being the firstborn of all creation. What do we know about the firstborn status from the Old Testament? They would be the representative of the family after the father passed away. They would get the double blessing or the double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn belonged to the Lord. The firstborn belonged to the Lord, yes. And so all of these ideas and many, many more help us see how Jesus coming as the second Adam would have been the one that belonged to the Lord, that would be our representative, and that would have had that preeminent status above all else. And so when we think about Colossians 1.19, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that's really comforting. Because if he's our representative, if he is the one who is the firstborn, he is the preeminent one of creation, even if he was not actually created, it shows us that we're going to be okay because he's the one that's responsible. And in Christ, God himself is showing us what it means to be fully human. So biblical theology guards the church, and it guards us from the attacks of Satan through bad theology and bad preaching. But it also acts as a guide. It's a guide to good preaching, good counseling, good outreach and engagement, good corporate worship, even good church structures. And we'll, we'll tackle some of these today. But real quick, why or how do you think the Bible acts as a guard or sorry, a guide to good preaching and teaching. How does biblical theology and the Bible, how does that help us have a good plan for how we preach at this church? Yeah, so the, the Bible is God-inspired, yep. What else? Jay. I love it. Because what, he, what Jay said is that you're going to read one portion of Scripture and you're, you're, you're judging that and, and evaluating it in light of the, of the rest of the Scripture that you have as well to make sure you're staying on track. How else do you think that biblical theology helps us have a good guide for preaching? Yes? You're right, and that's going to come in really handy when you're counseling someone, isn't it? Someone who's having a rough day and you're trying to encourage them because you've hit God's word in your heart. That's going to be the wisdom you share instead of whatever you read in a book this week. Pastor. So your question is how does biblical theology, not the Bible necessarily, not just being biblical, but you're saying biblical theology, how we've defined it. Yeah. So that's your question, right? Yeah. Yeah, biblical theology, what you had shared with us last week. Yeah. That's actually in my swan here. You can tell. We didn't plan the matching shirts, and we didn't plan that he was going to ask that question. Um, yeah. I love it. Biblical theology is the discipline of learning how to read the Bible as one story by one divine author that centers on the person and work of Christ so that every part of Scripture is understood in relation to Christ. So if that's a biblical theology, Jim. So then it helps you then provide the, the, the full truth. Yeah. It's not just pieces here and there because you have to have it complete to understand the truth because this is the truth. Right. If I were going to try to draw a word picture for you or something like that, I would say it's, it's kind of like the tracks that the train gets on. If I'm grounded and rooted um, in biblical theology, if that's the way I read scriptures, I can't go left or right unless the tracks take me left or right. I can't visit any towns that 
aren't on the way to my destination. I can only go where it takes me. And that's really helpful because, as some of you have probably experienced, you might listen to someone preaching, and they're here, and they're giving you a story from this passage, and yet they're touching on all of these things that are not in this passage. They're true, but you wouldn't understand that or know that based off of this passage. So it really does help keep us grounded and on track to make sure that we're faithful to the text. I've got something here on my notes. Uh, one fellow compared it to having court sense in basketball. You know where you're at in relation to the paint and the goal and where your teammates are. If you're a sports person, maybe that was helpful. If, if maybe you're a gamer and you're doing Fortnite or Call of Duty, it's going to be your situational awareness. Where am I in relation to the enemy? Where is our objective at? Who's got my six? You just, you're aware of all that's around you. You're not just isolated thinking, oh, I'm just going to focus in on this one piece. You have to have the whole landscape in mind. It places each text in the right context and helps you see what your text has to do with the person and work of Christ. It, it helps churches and pastors avoid preaching legalism or moralism, where you have to do this to get that, where you have to be good to get blessed. It rightly relates faith and works. We talked about that earlier. Some proof texts are going to teach you that you need to do good works to be saved, and they're probably going to hit up James, ignoring everything that Paul had taught. And this is key. It ensures that every sermon is a part of the big story. How could we take a study of the life of Abraham and use that to make the gospel clear? Do we simply slap an evangelistic post-credit scene on the end and say, oh, by the way, I just want everyone here to know something about Abraham's circumcision by telling you that you can receive the gift of eternal life by repenting and coming to Jesus. So come on in and let's, let's have you repent today. And you're thinking, but he was just talking about circumcision. What does that have to do with Jesus right now or my salvation? Or maybe you're teaching a lesson about David and Goliath. You know the story. David and Goliath. Nobody in Israel's army has the bravery or the courage to step up to the enemy Goliath who taunts them day after day. So you've got this young, naive little boy, little shepherd boy, and he's going to come fight. And he refuses the king's armor. He picks out five stones, nails them in the forehead with one stone, and then cuts off the head. What are some ways that people wrongfully take lessons out of this text? What are some ways that people wrongfully glean something from the text? Our circumstances, thinking that something in our life is our Goliath. I love it. I've heard that before. What else is something that somebody might uh, believe that they've learned from this lesson? or that they think God is teaching us in this lesson. How many stones did he have? What, what do those stones represent? Faith, love, hope, peace. I don't know, we got more than five. What, what do those five stand for? What about the fact that he only needed one? There's a lot of different things here. Whoa, what about... What about... Emergency preparedness. David must have had some training. He was ready to go. He was prepared for any situation, which is why he just stepped in and did what he had to do. There's a lot of things you could learn from this. Not all biblical, for sure. And does that mean we ignore all of those potential lessons? No, not necessarily. But it does mean that we need to find out what the truth is actually being communicated here in the lesson. A Jewish rabbi could teach a lot of sermons on this text. Have faith in God, God will give you victory. Right? That's something a Jewish rabbi could teach. Um, defend God's honor and be brave, just like David was brave. You could hear that in a lot of non-gospel preaching churches. There's, there's nothing wrong to them uh, to, to say something like that. That doesn't violate their conscience. Next week, Pastor Daniel is going to talk to us a little bit about biblical typology. Um, but one of the things you're going to read in the New Testament about David is how David is a type of Christ. And so when you're taking a look at this snapshot in time, especially if you're going to Mark 12 or Acts 2, you're going to see that 
David is the spirit-empowered and unlikely king who has come to rescue God's people from God's enemy. So really, this whole story of David and Goliath is far less interested in how brave you are or what Goliaths you have in your life, and instead wants to show you that God, in Jesus, is the king who's going to rescue you from your greatest enemy, sin. In short, if you're in a Sunday gathering or a Sunday school or a midweek small group, we need biblical theology to keep us on the track. We need to do the most important thing, and that's to accurately and faithfully teach God's word. One of the things that was mentioned earlier is how hiding God's word in our heart is going to help us be good counselors. And biblical theology will make sure that we really are good. Um, A younger Christian uh, once asked what he could do with his life or what he should do. Uh, someone married says that they need some encouragement or some counseling. They're struggling in their, in their honeymoon phase. Uh, someone else comes to uh, a leader in the church and says, well, I, I've been battling some addictive behavior, and, and I don't know what my first step should be. Someone comes to you after miscarrying, and they are brokenhearted. They are grieving, and they want some encouragement and advice from you. What we tell them needs to be more than some just little frou-frou saying that makes them feel good in the moment. We need to give them something substantial, something that they can actually take to the cross and say, God, I know that you are with me in the battle, in the darkness, in the valley of the shadow of death. I know that you know suffering. I know that you have endured my pain. I know that Hebrews tells us that you can truly identify with the experience I'm going through. Help me through this. And not just something that says, well, God says he'll help those who help themselves. Oh, don't you just know if you had enough faith, you could have got that job. Oh, you know, you must have some hidden sin in your life if uh, if God was going to let you miscarry the baby. You, you must have had some some hidden sin. Have you, have you guys talked to pastor about that? Have you, have you started confessing yet? We don't want to be those types of people. We want to have biblical theology guide us to good counseling. So when we respond, really, we, we want to make sure that it's the Bible speaking through us. Again, if we are proof texting, it's dangerous, and we've all done it, but we come up with some sort of Christianized version of behavioral therapy. Uh, The basic counsel is you simply need to learn by the power of the Spirit to think or act differently. Did you catch that? That this is essentially what we're saying sometimes if we're proof texting. You simply need to learn by the power of the Spirit to think or act differently. Now, the trouble, of course, is that in the story of Adam and Israel, uh, it should teach us that you can give people all of the information. The literal presence of God. Think about Jesus' disciples, you can give them all of the time, all of the knowledge, all of the tools that you would think would keep them from making a wreck of their lives. And yet, what does history teach us? Even being in the presence of God, whether it's in the Garden of Eden or the Garden of Gethsemane, (laughs) we're sinners and we still blow it. You can get people to engage in the right behavior for a little bit. If you're a parent, you probably know this. You can get kids to obey for a minute, maybe two, depending on the situation. But if you really want a changed behavior, it starts in the heart. And the same is true for us as adults. And when people are coming to us because they're grieving, they've got marital struggles, or they're going through some uh, some trials with an addictive behavior, or someone just lost a baby, And they're trying to get out of the grief and the depression because they want to just trust God. They know they should, but they're not sure how. How are we going to help them? Hopefully, it'll be with good biblical theology. We're going to search the scriptures for how to help them. But just giving someone a quick little Bible quote doesn't necessarily define all that there is to know. It doesn't really define who we worship either. We are fundamentally worshipers, and if we can help ourselves and everyone else understand who we should be worshiping, and that's Christ, then that's going to give us a much better model to live after. According to Paul, real change involves moving from idolatry to the worship of the true God. 
And that only happens through receiving and resting on what Christ accomplished on the cross. Again, we repent, we have faith, we search the scriptures, we obey. The Christian caught in sinful actions, sorry, destructive beliefs, or addictive behaviors is someone who's worshiping idols, as every fallen human does. So if you think about your friend who needs guidance, are they, are they stuck inside this, this loop of a bad decision-making or even indecision, which is choosing not to choose? Are they, are they stuck because they have a wrong conception of where history is heading and where they will find ultimate joy? Maybe they're refusing to move or budge or take action because everything in this world seems so scary right now. What about your friend who's in a difficult marriage? Are, are, are they or is she resting their hopes on the marriage? That the marriage just wasn't meant to bear? Are they, are they thinking, well, the reason we have to get a divorce is because it's too hard. There's, there's been too much sin. There's been too much brokenness. Is that what they're trusting in? They're just trusting in the idea that this was never meant to be. What about your friend who might be struggling with addiction? Why does this person think they were created? Were they created to eat, sleep, and be merry? To get the most pleasure in this life? Or were they created with a purpose? To glorify their God and enjoy Him forever? Biblical counseling, real gospel-centered biblical counseling, refuses to hold out for this false hope, and it actually gives solid theological answers. And Anytime you throw the word theological in front of something, it can scare people, but it's just the Bible the way it was meant to be understood. And that's what helps people. That's ultimately what brings about life change. Moving on to outreach and engagement. Outreach and engagement. Uh, In some churches I've attended in the past, um, there was a big emphasis on numbers. You were a spiritual person, or we were a good church if we had X amount of baptisms each year. So our services and our outreach events were all about getting people to sign a decision slip or walk an aisle so that we could dunk them, because that's how we gauged our success as a church. And I'm sure there are many other examples where churches have been led astray based off of wrongfully understanding the scripture to think that's the priority. It's not the priority to preach the gospel clearly. It's the priority to get them wet. And so if we have the Bible leading us, we're not going to preach cheap grace or easy believism or the whole idea of belonging before believing or only obeying the scriptures that really seem convenient in today's cultural climate. So you know what? You don't really need to have a stance on abortion or homosexuality, or immigration, or this, that, or the other thing. We know we're, we're just going to stick to love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others the way you want to be treated. That's what we're going to stick with. That's not a way to reach people. Uh, what about missions? I think our church does a really good job. Uh, there's a large group of people out there who cling to this idea of being missional. Being missional is not the same thing as being committed to missions, though, or being missions-minded. And yeah, this is semantics. We're kind of splitting hairs here. So you've got a large sector of Christians who really wave the flag of, I'm missional, or we are missional. And that's great, but it's not the same thing as being missions-minded or being committed to missions. A so-called missional church says that the church doesn't go on mission or send people out to do missions. Rather, the church is the mission of God into the world in order to heal the world and reconcile people to God. So they're missional by saying, we are the church, this is the mission. We need to go out there and do things. We need to reach people. And that can actually cause some good things to come out of it because God will use even the crummiest theology to accomplish his purpose. Uh, But think about our church. We are missions-minded and we are deeply committed to our missionaries. And I'm really excited that um, here in just a couple of weeks, and we're going to have some missionaries with us. We're going to hear testimonies and get updates. We have Missions Month coming up. Uh, But if you were to to go through and take a look at how missions is related to us in Scripture, uh, there's no doubt that you're going to stumble upon Matthew 5, 13 through 16, talking about how we should be salt and light in the world. But we also have everything that Jesus taught about going 
and being missionaries, discipling people, making disciples, teaching them and baptizing them in his name. But notice that the whole Bible's emphasis on the coming of Jesus, you've got to notice that this emphasis on the coming of Jesus, that is what we need to reach people with. It's not just about putting food in their belly or making sure that people are treated fairly. Those are great things, but we also need to make sure that the priority stays with their eternal salvation. That's what people need. The whole Bible emphasizes the utter uniqueness of Christ. That's what we offer that no one else can offer. And we'll also talk real quick as we get ready to to wrap it up with how Biblical theology guides us to good corporate worship. Um, if you were flipping through the Old Testament, yeah, you, you've probably come across that passage where David's naked and he's dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. You think we ought to try that next Sunday? Probably not. Do we? Uh, what about greeting each other with a holy kiss? Yeah, maybe not so much. But these are things that are in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, that means we should obey, right? Now, of course, we have to understand things rightly. What's the context? Not everything is prescriptive just because it's in the Bible. Yes, it might be there. It's a historical retelling. We're getting an account of what happened. That doesn't mean God said it was good. And so clearly, we don't want to have naked dances here at church. A right biblical theology helps us to answer what to bring into the New Covenant era and what to leave in the old. It helps us understand the continuity of the story of redemption. Much depends on this. And how we understand Christ's work of fulfillment is going to shape the way we do church. And speaking of the way we do church, good, Bible-founded, biblical theology is going to help us have good church structures. Good church structures. What about pastors? Is their job description similar to the Old Testament priest or the prophet or the king? Does Daniel need to like stop doing counseling sessions and meeting with people because he starts needing to hacking up animals? Not right now he doesn't. It's going to help us understand that his mission and that of all of us as pastors is the preaching of the word and the care of the flock. And we could go on to think about church discipline as well. Um, there's so much that's here. But as we wrap it up, just, just try to take away with you the idea that biblical theology is a discipline. It's something that we can all improve upon to make sure we're rightly handling the scriptures. We don't want to be the sort of people who uh, have a lot of answers for why we believe what we believe and a lot of great advice to share with people. And it's all in the Bible. And yet... None of it is actually understood properly. It's all out of context and misunderstood. Pastor. So Jason, to understand you rightly, you're showing us how these different things, how we view, how we view counseling, how we view church engagement and outreach, how we do missions, how we understand corporate worship, things like that. Things that we often take for granted, our view, and then we know there's other views out there in different church traditions. You're saying... Biblical theology is vital in understanding to get it right. Otherwise, we can just be all over the map. Absolutely. Without biblical theology, we're going to go wherever our heart takes us. And our heart is deceitfully wicked. But having biblical theology, we're always going to be grounded in the scriptures. And we're going to be held accountable to that. Any questions as we get ready to wrap it up in prayer? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this lesson on biblical theology. Lord, I pray that you would help us all as we read our Bibles to understand it rightly. And I pray that if we're ever unsure, that we would reach out to um, a pastor, an elder, uh, one of the deacons, or even a trusted friend, and, and really dig in and find out what the Scripture says so that we're making sure we're not false teachers and that we have good preaching in the church and good counsel for our friends. Please be with us in the time.